This is the story of how British interests abroad spread the English language and how it was changed and recharged by its foreign adventures. In India... There is a rally coming up, so I'll have to take a detour and come, sir. You know, in India, everything goes a little slow. In the Caribbean... Yeah, man. I used to pull him with my boat when I go into Black yeah, yeah. So one day I pulled him right at the spot and yeah. I said to him, I said, Flight, you know you can make some money here. <laughs> and in Australia. Can I hang out? No, I'm down by circular key, I'm some breaking. The forces of empire spread English around the globe. Whatever the rights and wrongs of this drive, it could truly be claimed that the sun never set on the English language. As it spread, it gave birth to new Englishes, and they became locked in battles for power and prestige with the mother tongue. New Englishes became a source of pride for some, of shame for others, of conflict, of liberation, even of brotherhood. And one outcome is indisputable. The English language was enriched immeasurably. In India, English faced a country of intense and elaborate civilizations, a magnificent empire, initially much greater than its own. And it faced an enormous challenge if it was to establish itself in a country which today boasts over a thousand million people and 200 different languages, including Hindi, Sanskrit, Bengali, Gujarati, Marathi, Punjabi, Kashmiri, and Urdu. But establish itself, it did. And here in Calcutta, the signs are still literally all around me. We gave English words to India, and some words from our experience in India have fed back into English. Most of them from Hindi, familiar words like blighty, bungalow, cheroot, loot, ghoul, thug, pundit, coolie, cashmere, dungarees, bandana, jodhpurs, pyjamas, cot, divan, shampoo, cash, toddy, deco, gymkhana, polo, bangle, jungle, cushy, khaki, doolally, dinghy, catamaran, caste, swastika, juggernaut, avatar, guru, karma, mantra, yoga and sacred cow. All these and many more were adopted from the subcontinent. Trade contacts through the early Middle Ages brought the first words from Asia into the English language, often through Latin or Greek, which absorbed them and passed them on. Words like pepper, barrel, ginger, panther, sugar, musk, sandal, camphor and opal all seem to have their roots in languages spoken on the subcontinent, and especially in Sanskrit. But the close relationship between English and India really began at the start of the 17th century, when the East India Company was granted a monopoly charter to seek out and trade with the rich spice markets of the East. This was a collision of cultures between the British merchant adventurers and the potentates of Oriental society. And in order to prosper, the English had to learn the lexicon of power and degree and to curry favour. Obsequiousness mattered. The English at that time were amateurs in class and social distinctions compared with a culture which included Maharaja, Mandarin, Nabob, Shah, Mughal, Khan, Raja, Padishah, Lama, Sayyid, Sultana and Maharani. The English had to kowtow and learn Bengali and Hindi to survive, and they did. In India, after years of negotiation, begging and buttering up the Mughal rulers in their own Persian tongue, they were allowed to set up trading posts, factories at Madras, Bombay, and amid the opulence of Surat. At 
the end of the 17th century, the English established another factory here in a tiny village on the banks of the River Hughley, which would become one of the world's greatest trading cities, Calcutta. What brought the English to India was a commodity that they could turn a profit on around the markets of the East, a commodity that India was famous for then and now, cloth. In India, the English found a variety of brightly coloured printed and woven fabrics. Delicate muslins, chintzes, calicos and ginghams. When these reached Britain, they became an instant success and their names as familiar as they are today. and Britain. It was the start of a relationship that would be enduring, passionate, and often marred by misunderstanding and violence. English had planted its foot firmly on Indian soil, but it had hardly announced its presence with a fanfare. The East India Company prospered, but in this vast country, its English-speaking employees were numbered in hundreds, not thousands. Some of the senior employees were encouraged to go native, take local wives and adopt local habits and dress. And when they wanted to conduct business, they had to learn the local languages. For most Britishers, this was a matter of commercial necessity, but there were others who had a more scholarly interest in India's languages. One of these British students of the Orient made a discovery which rewrote the history of the English language. English had traced its roots back to the dialects of the Germanic invaders from Frisia in the 5th century, as we did at the start of this series, but no further. But in 1784, William Jones, who was in India in his capacity as Supreme Court Judge, founded the Asiatic Society of Bengal to encourage inquiry into the history, civil and natural, the antiquities, arts, sciences and literature of Asia. And when Jones started to look at the ancient language of Sanskrit, a language written down two or three centuries before the Iliad and the Odyssey, he discovered what was effectively the prequel of the adventure of English. He discovered that one of the deepest roots of English was here in India. Jones made the startling discovery that there were similarities between words in Sanskrit and the younger languages of Greek, Latin, English and others. Where Sanskrit had Pita, Latin had Pater, Old Norse Father, Gothic Father and English Father. The Sanskrit Brata, Latin Freiter, German Bruder, Slavic Bratu, Irish Breder and of course English Brother. Even the forms of verb looked similar. English Am, Old English Yom, Gothic Im, Latin Sum, Greek Emi, Sanskrit Asmi. English is, Gothic ist, Latin est, Greek esti, and Sanskrit asti. Jones decided that this was evidence that they were all descended from one Indo-European language, and his work was the foundation of modern philology, the study of languages. English had acquired a new past, here at the headquarters of the Asiatic Society. It was just one of the new buildings with which the British were reshaping Calcutta. By 1765, the balance of power had shifted, the Mughal empires had collapsed, and the East India Company took over the administration and financial control of Bengal, India's richest province. Calcutta was becoming a colonial capital, a center of commercial, political, and social life. Here, the relationship between Indian and British became one of servant and master. A dangerous climate of feeling was developing that it was the duty and destiny of the British to govern in India. They were no longer going native, marrying Indian women, adopting Indian customs and learning local languages. They began to see themselves as superior to the native population. And the essence of their superiority was their religion.
In 1813, the Foreign Secretary William Wilberforce told the British Parliament that they were morally obliged to change what he called India's dark and bloody superstition for the genial influence of Christian light and truth. The British had looked at India and had decided that the Indians just weren't British enough. In the interest of their happiness and for the good of their souls, they needed to be converted to Christianity and Western morals. A string of missionaries headed east to devote themselves to this work. In order to teach their religion, they set up schools and they taught not in the languages of India, but in English. There were Indians who welcomed the establishment of English language education, recognizing that it could give India access to modern Western thought and scientific knowledge. But what happened next went beyond education. A new English language policy changed Indian society and its relationship with the British forever. In 1835, Thomas Babington Macaulay, writer and member of the Supreme Council in Calcutta, wrote his famous or infamous minute. In it, he laid out why he thought the teaching of English rather than any Indian language should become official government policy. He summed up. The dialects commonly spoken among the natives of this part of India contain neither literary nor scientific information and are, moreover, so poor and rude that it will not be easy to translate any valuable work into them. The claims of our own language it is hardly necessary to recapitulate. It stands preeminent even among the languages of the West. I think it clear that it is possible to make natives of this country perfectly good English scholars. And to this end, our effort ought to be directed. Today, that sounds astonishingly patronizing. It sounded so to many at the time. English would be the imperial language of India. There were some who welcomed it and saw it as a window to a bigger world, and they still do. Others who resented it as an intolerable imposition, and they still do. This English education would only ever be for a minority of Indians. Macaulay's intention in creating these good English scholars was to create a new class of Indians whose knowledge of the English language and ideas would make them loyal to their colonial rulers, a class who, he said, would be interpreters between the few thousand British in India and the millions whom they governed. These were the clerks of the Indian civil service who are known here as writers. This huge building behind me, the writer's building, was constructed to house them. From here, hundreds of thousands of instructions dealing with law, finance, health, commerce, and the nuts and bolts of government were issued in English. From here, the British, through English, ran India. As the 19th century progressed, the vast continent was opened up. British colonizers, engineers, surveyors, doctors, planters invested their lives in the adventure. British civil servants, working with their English-speaking Indian writers, administered it. Without the English-speaking bureaucracy, there'd have been no Raj, a word meaning rule or kingdom, taken from the Hindi. English was institutionalized now in India. It was part of the fabric of government. It was the language of preference, the language of prestige. And English, as often, was changed by this encounter. I stand under the shoes of my client and only seek to place my bone of contention clearly in your own. Over time, the English spoken by Indians became a particular ornate form, Babu English, it was called. Your Honor will be pleased enough to observe that my client is a widow, a poor chap, with one post-mortem son. The language was often taught by Indian to Indian, with no British ear to check its proliferation of florid phrases. Their relationship is only homeopathic, so the misty arguments of my learned friend will not hold water. The English spoken by the British also changed. The district officers, magistrates and other officials who toured the country, tending the Raj, picked up Indian words by the bushel, and incorporated them into their daily speech.
The British Army particularly relished picking up Indian words. They prided themselves on being able to bolo the batatora, meaning to speak the lingo a little. Or perhaps they were banged up to the eyeballs, stoned on bang, in which case they might need a word with the Amen Waller, the chaplain, and find themselves facing Tori Pichi, which meant delayed repatriation, and was taken from the Hindi words for a little later. The slang was so prolific that it needed a dictionary. In 1886, this great glossary of Anglo-Indian colloquial words and phrases was published, almost 900 pages of it. Here's khaki, taken from the Hindi for dust-coloured, meaning a light drab cloth. The dictionary notes that it is said that it is about to be introduced into the army generally. The dictionary has the curious title Hobson Jobson. As the book explains, this is another army term, a corruption of a phrase shouted by Muslims in a procession. There are plenty more examples of the way that the British adopted and altered Indian words. Chapati entered the English language as chow patty, perhaps with an echo of patty, or even a cowpat pushing it that way. The Indian plant cowanch, which has irritating hairs, became cowich, and the fish kakap became kokap. Allahabad became known as Isle of Bats. Bazikana, stale food, or yesterday's dinner warmed up, became brass knocker. Brinjal, aubergine, became brown jolly. And the great killer, cholera morbus in Latin, became the very English Corporal Forbes. Whenever they could, the British fled the threat of Corporal Forbes and the heat and dust of the plains in summer and took to the hills. In and around hill stations like Darjeeling, army officers, civil servants and tea planters built a little England, where they could take tiffin on the veranda with their memsibes, or sip a chota peg as the sun went down. The British had become comfortable with India, and English comfortable with its Indian borrowings. First the sun fears and glaring that scorches and bakes palanquins, perspiration and worry. Mosquitoes, thugs, coconuts, brahmins and snakes with elephants, tigers and curry. But while the English enjoyed their dominion, the seeds of Indian nationalism were being sown in meetings in this room, and rooms were like it, where the pioneers of Indian independence used to gather. Nehru himself, the young Nehru, used to come to this room. This was the unlooked for fruit of Macaulay's Minute and the education policy that had brought the English language to the Indian people. As well as words, they'd taken on ideas, Western ideas of democracy, self-government and freedom. And English had not only given them the theory, it had given them the language to communicate it to the world. Rudyard Kipling noted that many Indians claimed that they could run their own country and that some Englishmen believed them, but only because the Indians put their case in what he called beautiful English, which made it sound credible. Kipling dismissed Indian independence as no more than a pretty idea, but it was more. It was persistent. The English language had inadvertently sowed the seeds of the destruction of the Raj. The British didn't see it coming. When the Viceroy, Lord Curzon, choreographed a spectacular Durbar to celebrate the accession of Edward VII in 1903, India was still the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. And what or who could possibly dislodge it? Five years later, one of the leaders of the independence movement, a lawyer called Mohindas K. Gandhi, wrote a pamphlet in which he complained about the imperial status of the English language in India. To give millions a knowledge of English is to enslave them. The foundation that Macaulay laid of education has enslaved us. I do not suggest that he had any such intention, but that has been the result. Is it not a sad commentary that we should have to speak of home rule in a foreign tongue? What's fascinating is the idea that language can enslave a people. The British didn't much have slavery on their minds at that time. What concerned them was building a new symbolic capital, more than a thousand miles away from here, to be designed by Sir Edwin Lutyens, a new Delhi. Had they still taken an interest in Indian languages and customs, they might have come across the proverb which said that anybody who tried to build a new capital at Delhi was doomed. It had happened six times already. It happened to the Raj. 
the Raj would be lost, and with that loss would come a move to oust English from India altogether. We came to the island of the cannibals called Dominica, where we arrived the 9th of March. Near about this place inhabited certain Indians. They came down to us, presenting mill and cakes of bread, which they had made from a kind of corn called maize. And they brought us down hens, pines, and potatoes. These potatoes be the most delicate roots that may be eaten. The natives whom Hawkins called Indians had been given that name by Christopher Columbus in 1492. He thought he'd found a western route to India, but he had, in fact, made a landfall here, 12,000 miles to the east in the Caribbean, another stage on which the adventure of English would be played out. The name Caribbean itself, which denotes the Great Sea and the arc of islands which string out for more than 1,500 miles, came from the real name of one of the native tribes here, the Caribs, who were notorious for their fierceness and cruel treatment of captives. Another version of their name was Canib, from which we get our word cannibal. And the Carib languages gave English Cayman, Canoe, Curare, Peccary and Tamarind, among other words. From the language of another local tribe, the Arawaks came Hurricane, Cassava, Guava, Hammock, Iguana and Savannah. Two words used by Hawkins, maize and potato, and mangrove, barbecue, probably, and Jamaica itself. As we've seen in India and elsewhere, when English encountered new languages, it soaked up new words. But the adventure here in the Caribbean was very different from the one in India. There, English, initially at least, had had to accommodate itself to established languages, spoken by people with status and power. In the Caribbean, local people and local languages would be pushed aside. Others would be imported, and they would react with English and other European languages to produce rich and unique hybrids. English interest in the region had begun with attempts to hijack Spanish treasure ships by Drake, Hawkins and others with the unofficial approval of Queen Elizabeth. We were pirates and pirate tales were as popular then as now. By the time Daniel Defoe wrote his History of Pirates in 1724, words from their exotic and bloodthirsty world had already entered the language. Doubloon, pieces of eight, sea dog, cutlass, freebooter, privateer and buccaneer. In time, the buccaneers went freelance, preying on ships of all nations, hiding out in fortified bases they set up throughout the Caribbean. The buccaneers were eventually flushed out of their strongholds, like this one at Port Royal in Jamaica. The future belonged to other opportunists, the colonists, who'd already begun the systematic exploitation of the Caribbean. Where the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean meet lie the tiny islands of Nevis and St. Kitts. British settlement of the Caribbean began here, at Sandy Bay, in 1624. The first thing the settlers did was to drive the local Carib people off the island. The mainly English settlers at first grew tobacco, then switched to the more lucrative crop of sugarcane. They needed labor to work in the fields and mills. Soon they were importing slaves from Africa, slaves who picked up English words from sailors on the ships that brought them over and from the British on the plantations. The English that was spoken on St. Kitts took different forms. There were many British servants and laborers, and they spoke in their own regional dialects. But those further up the social ladder, the landowners and their managers, aspired to something more refined. One 18th century plantation manager called James Granger put these aspirations into writing in an epic poem in praise of the sugar cane. What soil the cane affects? What care demands? Beneath what signs to plant, what ills await? How the hot nectar best to crystallize, and Afric's sable progeny to treat? A muse that long hath wandered in the groves of myrtle indolence attempts to sing. 
In Britain, some critics hailed Granger as the first real writer to come out of the Americas. High society admired his ornate style as English at its best. Whatever its qualities, it was a world away from the language spoken by the majority on St. Kitts, that sable progeny of Afric, as Granger coyly puts it, the black slaves who now outnumbered the white settlers. A taste of their language was recorded by an English carpenter, Samuel Matthews, in the last decade of the 18th century. On St. Kitts, he wrote down the following exchange, a darker version of plantation life than Granger's, and perhaps the nearest we might get to the authentic voice of a slave. Vas mata body kwao, abri a boshe bang you. You tan na sobe ao, da bakra man go wrong you body kwao. What's the matter, brother kwao? I think the overseer hit you. You don't stand to know how that white man is going to wrong you, brother kwao. This is language that shows the speaker's African origins. Most of the words in this short passage are recognizably English on the page, but the sounds have shifted. Brother has become buddy, a word that's now very familiar, but this is the first time it was recorded. Overseer has become obishi. This is what happens when people try to voice strange words using the sounds that they know. We've seen it before in America, when the Pilgrim Fathers struggled with Native American words. There's another example here. The English word stand has become tan. That's probably because a lot of African languages don't allow two consonants to run together. So the ST of stand has become T, and the ND has become N. Stand, tan. English vocabulary, African grammar. There's one word straight from Africa, bokra, for European or white man. And another has come through Portuguese slave traders. Their word saba has here become sobi, to know. You tan na sobe ao, da bakra man go wrong you body quo. This kind of language is called a creole. It's the result of African and European languages colliding, producing hybrids spoken by the black population. Let me learn. No so trouble begin now. A good mind take van ton, so knock your rotten shin. This was the pattern throughout the plantations of the Caribbean. But on each island, the social and racial mix was slightly different, and each island developed its own unique Creole. Unfortunately, English wasn't a benign parent to what it regarded as its rather uncouth offspring. The Creoles continued to be treated by English speakers as unfit for polite society. This pressure meant that some Creole speakers tried to gentrify their language to sound more like the standard English-speaking social elite. So, throughout the Caribbean, there wasn't just a division into two languages, with standard English at one end of society and deep Creole at the other. There was a whole set of variations across society. But however many variations there were, standard English was treated as superior, at least by white speakers. The original inhabitants of the island had been cleared by brute force or disease. English had moved in with the settlers, and now it had dominion over the other forms of language that it had spawned, at least for the time being. Wherever English travelled around the globe, the story was the same. New colonies developed dialects of their own, even when no other foreign languages were involved. In January 1788, a fleet of 11 ships, commanded by Captain Arthur Phillip, sailed gingerly between these headlands, after eight months at sea, to make landfall in the country which would become Australia. The place they chose to settle would become Sydney Harbour. Today, the ferries which transport Sydney's commuters bear the names of the ships of what was known as the First Fleet, Sirius, Supply, Fishbourne, Friendship, Borrowdale. Their original cargo was also human. Over 700 seasick, half-starved souls, feared, despised and rejected by their British homeland, the ancestors of some of these commuters, the first convicts. Let us drink a good health to our schemers above, who at length have contrived from this land to remove over the next 80 years, over 150,000 convicts were transported to Australia. At Botany Bay, the hulks and the jails had some thousands in store. But out of the jails are 10,000 times more. 
who live by fraud, cheating by tricks and The British saw this as unsettled land, but of course it was peopled by native Australians. The Aboriginal tribes had over 250 languages. Many would disappear over time. But in the early days, the settlers were fascinated by the natives, and from them they learned the names for many of the new plants and animals they were encountering, like the kangaroo. English picked up more words from the native languages around Sydney Harbour. Boomerang, dingo, koala, wallaby, wallaroo and wombat. And cooey, which was a call used by natives to summon one another from a distance, was soon adopted by the English. And there's also a type of owl called the boobook, a tree called the warata, which has become the emblem of New South Wales. Warrigal, which is another name for the dingo, and woomera, a throwing stick. As settlement spread, English picked up words from other native languages. Billabong, a cut-off pool in the branch of a river. Budgerigar, yabi, which is a crustacean. Baramundi, a giant perch. And from Western Australia, kaili, another word for boomerang. When Australian English developed its own character, which it quickly did, it came less from the relatively few borrowings from the native languages. Overwhelmingly, it was shaped by the regional and criminal background of the early settlers. Some words that we think are most typically Australian were actually imported. Dialect words that have died out in England, but hung on in their new home. Cobber comes from the verb cob, meaning to take a liking to. Dinkum was a word for work, and fair dinkum meant something similar to fair play. And digger was another word that sailed halfway around the world, English then, Australian now. The new Australians got their most colourful vocabulary from the criminal slang of 18th century London, which was known as flash, or kiddie talk. Kiddie from the verb to kid, as in to cheat or to fool. Some of the words they used are familiar to us now. Chum, meaning a fellow prisoner. Swag was a bundle of loot. Job for robbery, Judy for woman, mug for face, pigs for police, beak for magistrate, lark for prank, split for betray by informing, put up job and stow it, meaning keeping quiet, are all found in Australia and in the criminal language of Dickens' Oliver Twist. It didn't take long for tension to develop between the prisoners and their descendants and the other British immigrants who'd come to make a new life in Australia and were forming the colonial establishment people like the MacArthurs who settled here at Elizabeth Farm near Sydney and invented the Australian sheep industry. These British incomers were known as Stirling and they spoke the language of the home country. The people born in Australia were known as currency and spoke the local dialect. At Elizabeth Farm, male convicts were assigned to labour in the surrounding fields, females to work as servants in the house and kitchens. Social divisions continued, defined by language. But over time, convicts who'd served their sentences could become citizens of the emerging country and call themselves government men, legitimates, exiles, or empire builders. By the 1880s, immigrants were outnumbered by native-born Australians, and Australian English was in rude good health. The weekly bulletin started appearing in Sydney. Known as the Bushman's Bible, it was sensational, outspoken and slangy. In its pages you find words like fair dinkum, larrikin, bonza, bloody, offsider, fair cow, butler and bludger, classic Australian. And there are examples of vivid Australian phrase making. Better than a poke in the eye with a burnt stick or as miserable as a bandicoot on a burnt ridge. And there are also poems and songs which helped create the image of the Australian bushman and his speech in the outback. Once a jolly swagman came by a billabong under the shade of a coolabar tree and he sang as he watched and waited till his billy boiled You'll come a waltz in Matilda with me Waltz. Waltzing Matilda. Matilda is slang for a bedroll. Waltzing Matilda means going on the road. Was written on a sheep station by the poet and solicitor Banjo Patterson in 1895. He watched and wide until he's Billy Boiled. You come a waltz. With its mix of words from English convict slang like swagman, meaning a drifter, 
and from Aboriginal languages like Billabong for pond and Coolibar for eucalyptus, Walsey Matilda encapsulates the essence of Australian English at the time. And in the figure of the swagman, who'd rather die than be taken prisoner, it captures an attitude, a contempt for authority, which would become a national trait. You'll never take me alive, said he. And his ghost may be heard as you pass by that billabong. You'll come a waltz in Matilda with me. Waltz in Matilda. But while the Australian vocabulary grew and Australian phrases were coined, Australian English didn't get official respectability. In 1926, the Director of Education in New South Wales could still write, It is sad to reflect that other people are able to recognise Australians by their speech. Most unfortunately, a variation from the accepted standard is along lines which are harsh, unmusical and unpleasant to the ear. Teachers must do their utmost to check this development away from standard English. All nations have their symbols, and Australia is well served by Sydney Harbour. This day, fit for a queen, their queen. As for New Zealand... So... The English language had sent its slang and its dialects to a new country where they developed a personality of their own. But standard English was keeping them in thrall. The ways of speaking in Australia formed a rigid social hierarchy. The broad vowels and slang were at the bottom. Standard English, Queen's English, was at the top. The convicts might have thrown off their physical shackles, but the local language wouldn't lose its chains until the late 20th century. Just as in the Caribbean, English was still keeping its children down. But all Australia was eager for a sight of this young woman. Here, too, it was the first time that the reigning sovereign had landed on Australia's shores. The British Empire, by the turn of the 20th century, was in its heyday. And British interests, as every school child knew then, had taken the English language all around the globe. The spread of the language was inseparable from the growing feeling of superiority which marked the empire and its people. When Daniel Defoe's shipwrecked Robinson Crusoe encountered the man he called Friday, the first English word he taught his new acquaintance was master. There was no question about who was in charge and no question about the language they'd use. As the empire spread, Crusoe's attitude became the norm. <laughs> Around the world, English pushed hundreds of local languages aside. In some cases, it could be said to have killed them off. Less than half the Aboriginal languages survived, and they now face extinction. North American languages also suffered, among them Lakota, the language of Sitting Bull and the Sioux people. Did you speak Lakota to your grandfather? He have to. Otherwise, he wouldn't understand me if I start speaking English. <laughs> Did you enjoy learning English? Uh, we, we have to learn the English. And if we speak Indian to each other, then both of us have to go up to the desk, teacher's desk, and she makes us stand in front of her. She gets this big ruler, about this long and this thick, and she slaps our hand, gets us till it's all red. Yeah. And they won't let us speak our language because I think they were trying to change us into white men. I spoke to Dolores Blacksmith in Chicago, but you don't have to go that far around the world to find examples of English bullying, no further than Wales. The military, political and social dominance of the English over the Welsh has always been reflected in their languages. When the two countries were united in 1536, there was no law actually to prohibit the speaking of Welsh, but no one who insisted on using Welsh was allowed to hold an official position. A prejudice against the Welsh had been established. It continued. 
By 1847, a royal commission declared that the Welsh language is a vast drawback to Wales and a manifold barrier to the moral progress and commercial prosperity of the people. And the Education Act of 1870 dictated that children would have to learn English. In schoolrooms like this, it could lead to unfortunate, even cruel practices. Welsh wasn't banned, but some teachers and schools outlawed it in the classroom. In some cases, a token like this, the letters WN stand for Welsh not, was placed around the neck of any child slipping back into their first language. The child was encouraged to inform on child, or Welsh on them, that's where the term came from. And humiliation was used as a cultural weapon. In the last years of the 19th century, there was a push to revive the Welsh language. It was led by the future Prime Minister of Britain, Lloyd George. The National Eisteddfod continued to promote and celebrate Welsh language and culture. Bilingual signage and official literature were introduced in the 60s, so that today the Welsh language can be seen everywhere throughout Wales. But it's debatable whether all this has really been enough to turn the tide. In 1900, half the people in Wales spoke Welsh. By 1981, it was less than one in five. The story seemed to be one of a long and irreversible decline, while English marched on from strength to strength. Just this year, though, surveys have shown that the number of Welsh speakers is increasing for the first time in two centuries. Welsh has found its way back into the schoolrooms, but it's still a minority language. 80% of Welsh people don't speak it at all, and its future is far from certain. But at least the days of the Welsh not are over. And in Wales, as elsewhere in the world, English is no longer acting as a state-approved bully. As the British Empire has faded away, English has had to come to terms with a changed world. Reaching accommodations with local languages and with new political realities. Here in India, the new constitution which followed independence planned to abolish English altogether and instead make Hindi the sole official language. But it didn't happen. Hindi is only the first language in some states of India, and other parts have their own languages, like here in Calcutta and the rest of Bengal, where Bengali is spoken. Regional rivalries are often fierce, and so the users of other languages exerted political pressure, in some places even rioted, to keep English rather than be forced to use Hindi. And even the most cursory glance at any of these bookstalls here in Calcutta will show you how English is still part of Indian life. It's a minority language, but it's the language in which many Indian states communicate with each other and with the outside world. And that gives it tremendous clout. Some would say, too much. It's 7.30 a.m. in Calcutta. The Toliganj Club is the favorite meeting place for the state's top officials and captains of industry. That's a lovely one. Thank you for the game. Now, who's signing for breakfast today? For these people, English is a badge, indicating they're part of India's social and ruling elite. Across town, in another world, street children are being taught the basics. For them, English might mean a finger hold, a scrap of advantage in getting a job against desperate odds. Across India, parents of all classes will make great efforts to make English part of their child's education. For this man, English is the language he must hire to deal with the bureaucracy of taxing a car. For this man, it's essential to his business. Somebody came and hit the vehicle. Many Indians slip happily from English into their native Bengali or Hindi and back again. For them, English has become, in a sense, another Indian language.
In other parts of the former empire, English and its linguistic offspring have also had to come to terms with independence. In Australia, it came late. The election of the Whitlam government in 1972 rode a wave of nationalism. Australia began to look back towards Britain less than it looked forward to its own future as a multicultural country. Four years later, the first Australian dictionary to be compiled in Australia reached the bookshelves, helping to legitimise the language and showing that Australia had cast off its cultural cringe and was ready to revel in its own distinctive language. This is the Macquarie Dictionary. In the, in the Ds alone, you find Australian words like daggy, meaning dirty or slovenly, from dags, the name given to the matted tufts of wool around a sheep's bottom. Dead house, a room in a hotel where drunks are put to sleep it off. Dello, a shortened form of delegate. Dingo stiffener, a dingo hunter. Dog's cock, an exclamation mark. Dog eye, an Aboriginal English word for a white person. Drac, an adjective depressingly unattractive, possibly from Dracula. And dunny, an outside toilet, a name that can be traced back to the English words dana, meaning dung, and ken, meaning place or house. In old British dialects, you could find danakin or dunnikin. The Australian shortened it and keep it in use. Vocabulary aside, Australian English has developed some distinct variations of its own. Could I hang up? Good. No, I'm down by circular key, having some bricky. I think there are two features that really earmark Australian English, at least for me. One is the abbreviations, the Australian love of shortenings, so that a word, if it's not already a single syllable, gets reduced to a single syllable, and then an ending is bunged on. E ending or an O ending. So something like my mate Jacko, you know, the weirdo journo from Frio, he slipped on a bit of lino during his smoker one arvo and ended up on compo and a real dero. Another characteristic I think of Australian English is the sometimes called HRT. This is not hormone replacement therapy, but high rise terminal. It's the Australian questioning intonation. So it really is like the rising intonation of a yes no question, except that you find it on statements. How old was this boy? He's 24 now. Was it Phil? Yeah, no. What did she say? Well, I caught her the Savo and. Um... Here in Australia, you encounter quite, well, amused, probably even hostile reactions now to British received pronunciation, Queen's English. People find them affected now and they're wanting much more to speak Australian English. Hey, you see this fellow over here? It's his Bucks party. Born. No more. Independence reached the West Indies in the 1960s and with it came a determination to reject the colonial past in all its forms. Here in Jamaica, there's been a campaign to make patois, the local speech, as socially acceptable as standard English. It's all around and no longer regarded as a badge of social inferiority. I'll make to the corner when I make it! Uh-huh. Wicked. Tomorrow now we're going to do um, some fried fish for the we have some kitchen tomorrow. So we're going to town. About a week after I've seen jam like a couple sticks in here or so, well, then it looks like he's going outside here. You know? Pull up! Anybody who wants to communicate with the public ear effectively in a language of, of feeling and a language that will get them to move and to act uses uh, Jamaican. Well, here we are again, the vibe master, Jerry D, you don't know. I want to play some Bojabantan, some Bob Marley, some Barry Salmon. Obviously, it's gone into popular music. It's um, radio, the radio talk shows are largely carried out in Jamaican, even by people who can speak English. It is not the, the language of, um, that, that, or simply for illiterate, ignorant people. Patwa on the airwaves or in the dance hall is one thing. For it to be tolerated or encouraged in the schoolroom is another. Now, if we were going to talk patwa, can you think of another way in which we could say, how are you? What could you say? How you do? Well, go on. What else how you do? How you do? What used to happen, right, is when Jamaica was under slavery, before slavery was abolished, the slaves, when they used to have to break... There are those, like the poet and performer Joan Andrea Hutchinson, who actively promote patwa among children. But it's not government policy yet to teach it in schools. Here, standard English is still the norm. Five, six, seven, and... 
And there are those who argue that children educated in Patwa at the expense of English would be placed at a serious disadvantage in dealing with the rest of the English-speaking world. What would you say to that argument? I would say a typical Anglo-Saxon uh, response. The Anglo-Saxons seem to think that people can only speak one language, right? In fact, multi multilingualism, bilingualism is the norm. There's no particular reason why Jamaica will be cut off simply because Jamaicans use Jamaican, or the language that is popularly called Patwa, for purposes of organizing their lives uh, internally and using English for international communication. But I think it's a mindset, an Anglo-Saxon mindset, in which uh, English is the, the official language of, of Britain and the US, and it's also an international language, but that's an accident of history. Historically, English began its imperial adventure as an export from our islands. It spawned new Englishes, new varieties, that were at first despised by speakers from the mother country, but which grew into distinct national tongues as their speakers freed themselves from their colonial past. Today, English and its offspring stand side by side around the world, a world in which English, as we'll see, has adopted a crucial role as a global language. <laughs>